ourselves, but Father, long obedience in the same direction, God, you can work in our hearts. And so, Father, I pray tonight that you would sow seeds of truth in our hearts as we now open our hearts to your truth. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we are tonight... Uh, in Genesis chapter 34, Genesis chapter 34, as we continue to make our way towards the end of this book, uh, and it's a, it's, an, it's a doozy of a study tonight. I don't know how else to say it. Genesis 34 is probably not one you ever hear taught in Sunday school. <laughs> as we go through it, you will see why. And so uh, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a heavy, very, I would call, intense study tonight because uh, Genesis 34 is just so problematic. Uh, so I have some, the, the headlines that I, that I picked out of the news, they're more kind of funny than anything else, and they're more kind of what than anything else. I saw, just a, by way of some current events going on, I saw that a driver, maybe you saw this too, I blew my mind. Someone driving using Waze. Do you use Waze? Yes. Yeah, you use, some people use the, the, Apple, the, the Apple one. There's, uh, what do you use? You don't use Waze? Did you say MapQuest, bruh? Are you, are you using it on your Blackberry? <laughs> Google, what? It's so, it's so, Brim, Blackberry, that's not on yours. I, Blackberry is so old now, isn't it? Zero percent market share. Don't you feel bad for Rim? Because Blackberry was where it's at. Wait, a lot of people use Waze. A lot of people use uh, Google Maps, use Google Maps, said Ernst. Well, Google owns, I think Google owns Waze now. Google owns Waze. Well, there was this, there was a, uh, a group of people in a Jeep using Waze. And it, it, apparently Waze gave them faulty directions, and they drove right into Lake Champlain. <laughs> Did you hear about this? Did, what? Was it foggy? Did they not see the lake? Okay, all right. It was foggy, all right? It was foggy, and it was raining, and of course they're using this for their insurance, but the, they drove off of a boat landing because Waze told them to go that way. <laughs> And they didn't realize that, that, nobody got hurt, thankfully, they didn't realize they were in water until they were almost in a hundred feet of it. Doesn't that blow your mind? I don't know if this article was fake news or not. Was it on CNN? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this was fake news. So to prove it, they put the same address into their ways in front of whoever it was, and it took them again off the boat landing. I was just like, whatever. But here's the thing. You know, even though the little thing is telling you to go this way, don't you still kind of look around? I guess it was foggy. I don't know. I don't understand blew my mind. This stuff blew my mind. Here's another one that blows my mind. Apparently in India, sending good morning texts is a big thing in that culture. It's a big thing of, of like, um, uh, what's the word? Being polite or something? Yeah, India. Yeah, Nebraska. <laughs> Appar apparently, yeah, in that, in, it, to, to get up and to send a good morning text to all your friends, well, this has become a big problem for them. So it's clogging up their bandwidth and their, uh, and their, their companies. And it's also because they usually send it with a little picture. It's also uh, harming the phones. The phone's storage is filling up. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. Don't they have the 128, 256 gigabyte? 90% of India is the 90% market share. Is Android, uh, Apple products are very, very, very expensive uh, outside of uh, outside of our um, United States, and so so this is interesting because I thought about this in the advances that we've created, the advances that we've created to make our lives easier and to give us conveniences. It's very interesting how problems are created by our advances. I heard a study just recently, and it said that folks today are just as depressed as they were 30, 40, and 50 years ago, even though we have the 10th generation iPhone, which is being discontinued. Did you hear that? It's, it's being discontinued. Mid-year mid this year, the iPhone 10 is being discontinued uh, because of uh, they've got a new line coming out, and there's, there's all kinds of reasons. It's the first time that they've ever discontinued a line this quickly, uh, but it's, uh, it's very, very interesting. But here's, here's the point that I, that I was thinking and making. It, it, here's the point that I, that I was thinking and making is, is that, man, we, we have so much stuff, but the stuff doesn't make us so much better, does it? It doesn't make us so much better. Uh, I thought this was great. There's a male student at Missouri State who uh, apparently used the Tinder app, and I don't know what that is, so don't judge me. I don't know what it is. I think it's a dating app. Uh, I, all I know about is FarmersOnly.com. That's all I know about. That's all I know about. <laughs> Awkward. 
You look, Phaedra, you don't have to be lonely, okay? Everybody knows that. Just like state nationwide is on your side, right? Um, so this guy, find, I thought this was great. This was so fun. He, fa- he saw this female at his campus called Claudia. Claudia, that was her name. But he swiped right or something. I don't know. You've got to swipe one way. And, and it, if you swipe one way, it dismisses them. If you swipe another way, it sends them a message. Well, he swipes the wrong way. So what does he do? He sent a mass email to his entire campus looking for her. Way to go, dude. Way to go. Yeah, he's like, I saw you. You've got this color hair. If that's you and you'd like to go out for donuts, let me know. (laughs) That dude, hey, hey, are you kidding me? Somebody told me today about a friend that, that they have that keeps asking girls if they want to go on dates or whatever, and they keep saying no. And I said, good on him. Good on him. <laughs> I like this. You know, if you're not, it, it, I like that, that he look, he went looking for her and now they're going out to get donuts. I think that's great. Okay. Here's another thing. You don't apply. You're going to applaud. So he ain't even here. All right. These are, these are, I love you, Rachel. All right. Check this out. This, I can't believe these next couple ones. This is headline news. A plan B's, and it's not what you're thinking, emerge to cool the planet. Did you see this? Because plan A is not working. You know what plan A is, right? That's limit all of the, you know, CO2s that companies can create or make and then restrict it, restrict it, restrict it. It's not working, okay? It's not working. And so they're coming out with plan Bs now. And plan Bs include spraying, this is, I I can't make, I, I can't even make this up. To me, it's so dumb. It includes spraying stratospheric aerosol injections into our stratosphere. So basically taking, you know, aerosol and and releasing a huge kilotons of aerosol product into our atmosphere so that the reflective particles will block and reflect the sun's rays. This is a real plan. It's a real plan. Uh, Did you say hairnet? I love you. Hairnets are better. Amen. (laughs) But there are some that are now coming forward and saying geoengineering, because that's what it's called. Rapid geoengineering is dangerous. You think, Professor? This is real stuff. This is, this is real stuff. Here's some other real headlines. These are fun. I'm, I hope we're having fun now. Because once the Bible study starts, the fun is over. Okay? <laughs> over. Real headlines. This is a great one. A one point... This is real. A 1.7 billion year old chunk of North America has been found... Sticking to Australia. (laughs) Apparently, there are some rocks in Australia that they say are consistent with the North American continent, and therefore they say there's a piece of North America stuck to Australia. Are people in a room, you know, are they like sitting around a table, and they're like, "What, what is this, you know? Oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. It's a piece of North America stuck on Australia. Give that guy a raise. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, you know, who knows? You know what it means? It means people are dumb. Okay, here's the next one. And I can't believe this is a real headline. Biologists believe finding viruses is first step to finding aliens. I don't even, I don't know whether to laugh, cry, or throw some aerosol in the stratosphere. I don't know what to do with that. This is real stuff. This is real stuff. I saw another one on genetic DNA reengineering this week that said they took 800 descendants of this guy in like Norway or something and they were able to reconstruct his DNA through his 800 descendants. Who paid for that? You know, we we could have been studying the piece of North America stuck on Australia. Silly. Isn't it silly? I don't know. I'm, I didn't do the work. Rachel, I wouldn't spend my time doing that. I'd be doing things that are more important, like sleeping. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, my. The, the headlines have just wowed me. I, wanted, I do want to say I really appreciate those that take the time to send me headlines because half of those were sent to me. And they are just like, man, they're so good because you see something that just blows your mind and then you send it to me. And, hey, man, then you get, you get put on TV. So that works. Okay. <laughs> Genesis chapter 34. Genesis chapter 34. If you remember last time we met, Jacob and Esau re- rekindled their relationship. Do you remember that? I, 
by way, it's already a mess. What's going on with Jacob and Esau is already a mess. And I, I want to ask you this. This week, this week, what, what role has God played in your life? What role? I mean, and, and, and I, I want you to think about this. And there's, there's a part of us that will be encouraged, most likely. A part of us that will probably be convicted. But I want, I want to bring you to reality that I want you to know God should be the center of our lives. But even if he hasn't played that role in your life, I want you to know that you are the center of his life. All week long, man. All week long. And I, I, think that, I think that is encouraging. I think it's humbling. Because if where, where would you be? Where would you be, man, if God was the center of your life? And I'm thinking about this. I think about this all the time. And it, it, I don't know, it haunts me because God is so good. God is so good and he's so beyond my finding out. And what he has done has brought life to this darkness that I know as existence. He's brought purpose to, to a heart that, that was wrought with self and still is. Fr frankly, and still is. And yet somehow he brings light to that. And he's, he is magnificent in all definitions of the word. And so I sit back and I say, God, are you the center of my life? Am I answering the call that you put on my life? Or is there, is there more? Is there something I am missing? And if there is, God, would you bring it through your word for me? As I get up, as I get up, get in your word, would you bring it as I just talk to you during the day? You know, as you pray, you know, do, is is that your heart or are you just doing life because i, I want to ask you that what role is god playing in your life today the right answer to that and this is the answer that has freedom attached to it this is the answer that has eternity attached to it everlasting life life and life and life abundant is he is the center of your life he's the center of your life what does that look like though well we're going to see a little bit tonight of what it doesn't look like and then i'm going to show you on sunday a little bit of what it does look like Sunday's going to be such a good study as we finish up the chapter of Acts that we're in. But I want you to know, and I want to encourage you, that you, it's like, it's like the world and you and me and everyone in it was lost, spinning out of control, chaos and everyone on their way to hell with no chance of redemption. And God, from the very foundations of the earth, cast a net wide enough for all men and women. He cast a net with his son. He cast a net. And where, where I was like a kite without a string, just flopping around in the wind, eventually going to crash, he cast a net and pulled me in and has created something out of my life. And, and, and more so than that, what's more important to me than that is he's created someone that encourages April. He's, in, he's created someone that loves Lincoln. He's created someone that would die for Madison. And, and that to me is more depth of purpose than just joy in my own heart. Does that make sense? And it goes beyond my family. You know what I'm saying? He's created in me a desire to actually serve Chin. You know what I'm saying? To serve Pete, to be around you. You know what I'm saying? To be in contact with you and be more than just a parasitical attachment on your life that just wants something from you. And I can't do that on my own. I can't create that heart in me. In fact, all I want to do is get what's in your pocket into mine, in my flesh. But God does something else, man. He casts a net wide enough for all men and women, and he makes you and me the center of his life because he is an infinite God, and therefore he can give all of himself to everybody at all times. He's infinite. And therefore you are the very center of his life. Isn't that cool? But what role does he play in yours? Jacob has had an interaction with God several times, and you have too. I, I, I think I know mostly everyone in the room tonight. You have too. And Jacob yet still falters, and Jacob yet still makes mistakes. But with each mistake, he's walking a bit differently, especially with his last one, right? Where he, his will, his will, he demanded that his will prevail over God. Opposite of humility is pride. But pride is such a word that we just, we just laugh it off. When, when there is someone or something in your life that brings correction or guides you a different way towards the Lord and you buck against it, that's pride. And, and, and what does bucking against it look like? You don't do it immediately, quietly, submissively, completely. You compromise. Compromise always 
brings consequence. Compromise always brings consequence. One of the greatest things that God has given me in terms of administrating a marriage and a wedding ceremony is the fact that I will say from the pulpit that God will never bless you if you compromise with each other. Because he doesn't bless compromise. God blesses only sacrifice. Compromise means I'm getting what I want in a half way and you're getting what you want in a half way and therefore I will resent you for it. Compromise always brings consequence. And with the Lord, with the Lord, compromise can be easily avoided through repentance, humility, which is the opposite of pride. But Jacob is walking in compromise. Specifically, we see him compromise when God told him, go back to your people, go back to the promised land, go back to Bethel, go back. And he doesn't. Remember, he goes to Succoth. Remember that? That place, Succoth, all right? <laughs> and he built a house. He built a house there. Kind of like a tower of Babel, as it were. It's the first one of the, four, the forefathers, the patriarchs, to build a house. He built a house. He says, I'm going to put some brick and mortar here, but that's not where God has asked you to be. And so he leaves that place called Succoth, and he comes to a place called Shechem, and Shechem is on the very outskirts of the promised land. He's on the right side of the Jordan River now, but he's still on the outskirts. God's still not the center because he's not, put, he's not there. He's not in full compliance with what God has called him to do. And so this compromise, we're going to see has consequences. Look at chapter 34, and I'm telling you, this is a tough chapter. But man, if you got ears to hear and eyes to see, you're going to be blessed by it. And if you don't, if this hardens you, then man, you're missing out. You're being ripped off by the enemy, and you're walking in the flesh. The Bible will call that nonsense, foolishness. I will call you tonight to give your heart to the Lord. I've been a Christian my whole life, man. Don't tell me to give my heart to the Lord. Give your heart to the Lord. My heart leaks out the grace that God puts in it today. That's why, remember in the, in, the, in the wilderness, the manna would come every day, and if they tried to store the manna, what would happen? It would rot. It's the same thing. If we try to store up, well, I've been a Christian my whole life. Okay, keep eating that last week's manna. Tastes like sucketh, doesn't it? <laughs> we need new manna. You know what I'm saying? We need new manna every day. And so I need to give my heart to the Lord today just as much as I did yesterday, if not more, man, if God is the center. And it says there in chapter 34, verse 1, Now Dinah, remember her? She's the one that's in the kitchen. What's she doing out? I'm sorry. It's bad. I'm so, I, it's so bad. Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah, man. It's a joke. Wow. Now Dinah. Dinah. Where's my Dana? I'm sorry, Dinah. The daughter of Leah. And we don't know, we don't know if, if Jacob had other daughters. We're not given any more names. We're just given Dinah. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Eleven brothers, bless you. Eleven brothers. Eleven brothers. We're not given any, any implication that she has any sisters. And we know that there are female servants and people in the household. But she goes out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem... The son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her. He took her and lay with her and violated her. See how this is not a Sunday school teaching? Hey, kids. <laughs> bad. It's a bad scene. It's a hard chapter. In fact, we have come to a couple of hard chapters and the chapters to come as well. Chapters that will depict and report de deplorable deplorable things. A Bible commentator named Leopold said of preaching on this chapter, we may well wonder if any man who had proper discernment ever could draw a point from this chapter. <laughs> In other words, it's a hard one to preach. But check this out. This is some shameful stuff and we will read it. And we will study it. But the fact that it's included in the text is interesting to me. If the Bible was written by the minds of men, and I love this. Well, the Bible's written by men. Have you read it? If the Bible was written by the minds of men, then stuff like this would not be in here. How, how does this prop up Israel in any way? There's no agenda here. You know, there's no agenda in the Bible at all. I want you to know, other than to give the truth of God to the creation of God. There's no agenda. If there was an agenda, stuff like this wouldn't be here. It does not make valiant the history of the patriarchs. It doesn't in any way. This chapter does the opposite. 
But that's one of the many ways that we can know for sure that this book is not the result of a man's agenda, and I like that. And so here, it says that Dinah went out to see the daughters of the land. Now, notice, they're in the land of compromise, number one. They're in a place of compromise, and she goes out to see from within the land of compromise. I wonder, you know, and I'm, I'm going to be hard on Jacob tonight. I wonder, would this have been the case if Jacob, man, just where would you be? If God for the last six months was God to you and not just a, a, a instrument of blessing, an instrument of provision, God provide for me, God bless me, I need prayer, God do something, what would, where would you be if for the last six months, 12 months or six years, if God was God and you sought him where he's at, not where you're at, you know, and you went after him instead of forcing him to come after you, God bless me. God provide for me. They're in the land of compromise. And so Dinah, she goes out, the Bible says, to see, and that in the Hebrew means to see and to be seen. She goes out to see and to be seen, to observe, to consider, and to experience that culture. In our applicable parallel, she went out to experience the world. She went out to experience the world. Parents in the room tonight, that scares you, doesn't it? That statement, she went out to experience the world. That scares me. might scare you too. Because we've been around a bit longer than our kids, haven't we? And I'm not even talking about just your 6, 7-year-olds. I'm talking about your 16, 17, 22, 23-year-olds. It scares us to see, and to, and to see in their eyes their desire for the world because we've been around a bit longer. We've seen what's out there. Either we've ventured out ourselves and made grave mistakes that, listen, this is why we, we are so heavy sometimes on our kiddos because I know that the mistakes I've made and some of the mistakes you've made, you will regret and carry the rest of your life. The consequences. You think, man, I, I, is anybody here, did, did anybody here get in big time credit card debt when they were like 18 or 19 years old like me? I got in big credit card debt while I was in college. You know why? Because as soon as I got that college education, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to blow up, you know? Everybody's going to want to hire me. And so I, I went into credit card debt as a, as a student in college, like three or four or $5,000, which, you know, might not be that much money, but it was a lot to somebody who's, you know, a student because I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to make so much money when I get this degree. It's amazing, man. I think there's, there, that still is prevalent to even young, the young today say, well, I can go out and do these things. And then when I get old, I'll be like you, dad. No, no, no. You never will escape the consequences of what you do in the world. They'll always be with you. God will forgive you, that's for sure. God will give you even holy forgetfulness, that's for sure. But I promise you this. You'll carry it the rest of your life, man. You carry it the rest of your life. And so she goes out to experience the world, man. Maybe you've heard some stories of, uh, maybe that's not you. Maybe you grew up in a home where your parents prepared you well and you didn't go venture out into the world, but you've heard so many stories of folks being where exactly Dinah is now, violated, violated. Where is Jacob? You know, it, this, this is what blows me up about this scripture and this set, is that Dinah, the daughter of Leah, goes out to experience the world. Where on earth is Leah? Where is Jacob? Where are the 11 brothers? These are real questions that the text gives us no details about. Doesn't that just, I'm like, I'm like, where is it? You know, I'm like looking between the page. You know, I'm like trying to split it in half. You know, is it there? Where's Jacob in this? What's the situation about, around Dinah walking out that front door? Was she headstrong? Is she sneaking out? We don't know. But she goes off to see and to be seen by the world. And she is seemingly unhindered. And she is seemingly unprotected. Two things that my children will not be. My children will not be unhindered, and they will not be unprotected. I will be a big blockhead. <laughs> a blocker. Blocking them if they begin to talk about going off into the world. And if they go, and this is where things are going to get a little bit hard tonight, and I'm probably going to offend your flesh a couple times tonight, but hey, it's Wednesday, so, you know, there you go. If you come on Sunday, I'll give you a donut. <laughs> If they go, Brantley, Madison, Lincoln, if they go, because ultimately they will reach an age where it's their decision, I will make sure they're well prepared, protected with truth, not only from what I say and what I preach, man, 
but they will be protected from the truth of watching mom and dad live for Jesus behind closed doors, behind open doors, in the mall, in the market, at the church, at the workplace. We cannot deny him. They're going to be prepared by the genuineness of it, that we are a mess, that we are at fault all the time. And yet in humility, God restores us daily, daily, daily unto fellowship because he's good, we're not. He deserves our lives. So we won't beat them with religion. We won't beat them with Bible study, Bible studies. We will teach them by loving the Lord. And that is, people, much harder. Much harder to do. Much harder. Because we actually have to die to ourselves to do that. But that's the only thing that's going to prepare someone that makes a decision to go out into the world and experience the world. It's the only thing. What you say is going to go in one year and out the other. They're not going to care one bit. Are they watching dad hit the bottle at home? Then it doesn't mean anything to them. Are they watching mom blow up at dad at home? Then it doesn't mean anything to them. It's much harder to follow the Lord. It's much harder for April to love me as Christ loves the church and for me to love her as Christ loves the church. It's much harder. But that we know, she and I, we know, will prepare them if they make that decision. And so they will be protected. The other side of that is this. That if they so wish, we will let them find the emptiness of hunger that drives them to eat the pods with the pigs. If they so wish, we will prepare them. And yet, if they make the decision to go into the world, we will allow them to find the famine that is in the world. We will allow that, and it will break our hearts. But we love the Lord more than we love our children. We love the Lord. We are sold out for Him. He has given His life for us. We can do nothing else. What are we going to deny? The very spirit that cries out within us of truth? I can't do that. I will deny my children first. That's a hard thing. I don't want to get there. I don't ever want to go there. But I know this. We're prepared to go there if we have to. Dinah just goes. She just goes. That's a mysterious and disturbing thing to read because nobody seems to stand in her way and she doesn't seem to be prepared. We read that Shechem, the son of Hamar, who was a man of, te- of power, took her and violated her. In that culture, it, you got to understand in that day, a woman by herself roaming about the city could be violated with little repercussion, could be taken. And with very little repercussion in that culture, it's just the way it was. And so Dinah is violated, and we don't really know what that means, by the way. We don't really know what that means. Everybody been preaching, you know, I listen to a thousand commentators on this. Everybody says rape. The word rape doesn't occur in the Bible. Did you know that? Doesn't occur. The Bible talks about being forced to lay or whatever, but that word doesn't occur in the Bible. It is so far from the very character of God, he didn't even put it in his book. And so we don't know what it exactly means, but the word in the Hebrew means she was humbled by him in a way that was against her will. Verse 3 says this. You guys okay? Okay. I I told you it's tough. Do you want me to go back to the headlines? Ways. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Watch this. There is, some, there is some significant truth in these verses. His soul, verse 3, was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. Did we just read that he violated her? It's very interesting what God is teaching through these... I, it blows my mind. God is so magnificent. Continues, it says... So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this young woman, get me this young woman 
as a wife. There's a key word in those two verses, verses 3 and 4. A key word to understand what's going on and to bring it to what I think is most valuably applicable in our own lives. It says here that his soul was strongly attracted to Dinah. And he loved her and spoke kindly to her. This is explicitly stated here in plain text that this is a soulish love. It's a soulish love. It's not a spiritual love. And I want to talk just a couple minutes about these two different things. He loved her for what she could give him, not for what he could give her. Get me, he says of her. Get me. Not get me for her. Make me perfect for her. No, no, no. He's got a soulish love. And this suckers so many beautiful, wonderful, young women every day that are violated by a man that will eventually be another woman's husband. You know you can be violated and be consenting. Did you know that? You could totally be violated while consenting. I don't mean to be harsh, but what I want to do is prepare you and give you truth. Wait for the love that God blesses. Wait for the love that God ordains. Make God the center. Make God the the God of your life. And wait for the love that glorifies God. And that is a spiritual love in which He will love you for how He can serve you and give Himself for you, not a love for how you can serve Him and give yourself for His bodily, fleshly fulfillment. He may be kind, he may be kind. He may say he loves you. But if his desire is to lay with you without committing the rest of his life to you loyally and under God, then his love statement is a violation of what is all true. It's a violation. Be very careful. Regret will fill your heart. Even if you end up marrying him, I promise you this. Regret will fill your heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says... And you don't have to turn there because I'm not going to quote it. You can look at it in your own time. That physical sin is a different kind of sin. It's a sin that stays with you. It's a consequence that you bear the rest of your life. It's a weight that you bear. And God will make you strong. It's His yoke. His burden is light. God will make you strong. But you will forever walk around seeing things that you ought not to see because your eyes are open to it. You'll forever walk around with your heart woke to something you don't want it woke to. I don't know how else to do that because for the pure, all things are pure. And you right now, to the pure in the room, you know, you know very little about what I'm talking about. You must receive it by faith and heed the warning without experiencing it. And I know that's hard. That's a hard thing. That's a hard thing. But there are many tonight that still carry the weight and the wounds of the consequence, even if you married him. I want you to know that soulish love is not a bad thing in and of itself. I want you to know that. I want you to know that. It's just not primary. It's just not primary. You want to find and wait for spiritual love. And that's a love that gives themselves for you. And if you tonight are, are, you know, this doesn't just go for the, for the folks that are, you know, single or, or whatever. It, doesn't, it goes for us too that are married. That I don't want to just pursue a soulish love with April where we get along all the time. I want, to, I want to pursue a spiritual love with her where I have the heart, like God has a heart for me, I have the heart for her to serve her and to give myself for her. And that love, it gives more joy than any daggone soulish love or physical love possible. But if you take that spiritual love and you mix it with a strong attraction of soulish love and then you stir it up and add a pinch or maybe more of a pinch, woo-woo, a physical love, <laughs> I want you to know, I want you to know that that's where it becomes ba-boom, man. ba blad out blad out Blessed by God. Blessed by God. And that's what you need to be after. And what I need to be after is a spiritual love primary. Number one. A soulish, soulish love is good too, but not on its own. And not as primary. It has to be secondary. The attraction and the personality connection. No, no, no. First and foremost, I give my life for you. And I'm not in this for what I can get out of it. I'm in it to better your life, to bring you closer to the Lord. I love, you know, you know one thing I love about where we are as a church is that my daughter is sitting in this Bible study right now. I just love it. I love it. 
because it's so important. And if you want what God has for you in your marriage, then you will pursue a spiritual love. And what does that mean? That means you must be strong in the Spirit. You must be walking with the Lord. You must be seeking Him in your life. He needs the right role in your life. And then you will have this spiritual love. And by the way, even if you never get soulish love from her, and if you never get eros, the spiritual love will sustain you. It'll sustain you. That's how strong it is. But soulish love on its own won't sustain you. You'll always want something more. And physical love won't sustain you. You'll always want something more. And so they're secondary. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. But they're secondary. Shechem has a soulish love. And even if he speaks kindly to you tonight, even if he says he loves you, if it's not spiritual, it's a lie. He loves what you can do for him. And eventually he'll get bored with you. Let God be God. Trust, trust the Father. Walk in his ways. Verse 5, And Jacob, and Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. How? How did he hear? I want details. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want to know more than what's given to us. But God is so... He's so wise. It says that Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob held his peace until they came. Number one, I just want to point this out real quick. His sons were with their livestock instead of with their sister. There's something in that for me, that we have livestock in this church. Do you know that? Not you, not us. That's no, no, no. Livestock, like projects, programs, plans, vision, livestock. All of this, everything that we feel and see and touch and do. But there are also sisters in the room, brothers in the room, and that's the priority. That's the pri that's the priority. The brothers were it with the livestock. They're with the cows, man. What are they doing? It blows my mind. Where is the weeping? So Jacob, so Jacob held his peace, it says, until they came. Held his peace. Held his peace. This is his daughter held his peace. Where is the outrage? This chapter for me needs much more. I don't get it. I'm left disgusted by so much, which again is a proof positive to me that men with soulish minds did not write this book because I'm disgusted by this. Where is his outrage? If they, if they had soulish men had written this book, it would be so much different. But God has other things for us to focus on. And that's why I don't think we get the details. That's why I don't think I get the details. If you're ever reading through the Bible, studying through the Bible, you're like, I just don't get that. Guess what? Move on. Move on.org. Move on.net. <laughs> Move on. Because there's something else God wants you to get, you know? Something else that God wants you to get. Because right now I'm just, I stop there and I'm like, well, I, I, I'm looking at my notes, verse 5, and I'm just blink, blink, blink. The blinkers just blink, blink. You know what I'm saying? Waiting for me to write something. And I'm so angry. Where's the outrage? I think, man, if I had hair, I would have just squeezed it all out if I heard that. You know what I'm saying? I'd be so angry. I'd just go, Pff. <laughs> Verse 6. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. Was Jacob's veins popping? He breathing hard? Was he red-faced? I don't know. I'm telling you, you know what I'm saying? I love the Lord, but I will lay hands. You understand me? All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a great disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be. Now, not, not to be done. Now, I'm not going to go into this, but this is the first time it's the mention of the nation Israel in the Bible. Isn't that amazing? It's the first, first time. It's the biggest mess on earth, isn't it? And it's the first time that it's ever mentioned. I think that God can do so much with so little. You know, God showed me something the other day. You know how he said, with a, you think this is good? He said, with a, mus a faith the size of a mustard seed, I can say to this mountain, get up from here and it'll move. Remember that? And God, I've always thought that that always meant, well, that just means I just need to have a little faith because faith is so powerful. But you know, God just changed my whole perspective the other day. And he said, no, it's so you won't brag about it, dum-dum. Be like, man, Matt, what, this is such a, your, your worship team here is just filled with the Spirit. The people here just love the Lord and the church is so alive. How'd you do all that? Ha ha ha! Ha ha ha! Look at that little thing! <laughs> that 
that's why it's a mustard seed because I can't boast in it. You see what I'm saying? They're like, yeah, right. That's stupid. That sucketh. Isn't that great? Just blows your mind. Something completely different. God can do so much with so little if we'll allow ourselves to be little. There are so many Christians that won't let themselves be little. Hey, uh, Chin, I want to do this thing. I want to change all the carpet to green or, or, or red. And, you know, and Chin's like, I don't know if that's a good idea. Oh, Lord. That's fine. Well, wait a minute. Are you mustard seed? Or are you mustard boulder? We don't let ourselves be little, man. Uh, I think, you know, before you go and do that, then you need to, you know, concentrate on your own home. Your home is not in order. What are you talking about? How dare you say my home is not in order? I get this all the time. I, I, who, who, made, who died and made you king? I'm not your king. I'm your pastor. I'm not your king. I'm your brother in the Lord. When did your mustard seed become so big? Oh, I don't like being called little. Well, who does? The Spirit of God in you cries out, Abba, Father. doesn't cry out, Hey, buddy. Father means I'm little. Jacob heard it. said that Shechem comes out to him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field. When they heard it, the men were grieved and very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son, there it is again, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as wife and make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters to yourselves. So you shall dwell with us and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. I see this as an invitation. It's an invitation we've got your daughter we've already got her give us the rest of your family and this is interesting because there's something prophetic here if they would have done this if they would have mixed their bloodlines right now then guess what could not have happened the messiah could not have come because the bloodline would be lost it's very interesting what's going on this invitation on the surface sounds good it sounds peaceful it sounds profitable hey we're going to make marriages we're all going to join in and we're going to have greater profit but the ask is this Lose your identity. That's the ask. Lose your identity. Stop being different. Fold into us. And this is a real danger. Oh boy, this is going to be so, it's so tough to teach this stuff, but I want to teach it. This is a real danger when one of the children becomes part of the world. It's a real danger. Let's tolerate. Let's welcome. Let's have unconditional love. I'm not here to tell you what's right or wrong in your situation. I'm here to tell you to seek the Lord. But many tolerant and welcoming parents and welcoming friends and tolerant friends stop many wayward youngsters and people from finding their pig pod and they're lost for good. You know, I've had many conversations with people that say, well, we need to help this brother. We need to help this brother. And I say, what? And, and, and allow another year to go by where they don't find that they need the Lord? An another year? Another week? Another month? No. What if we just stop right now? What if we just stop coddling their sin right now? Then they have a shot in a year from today of being free. But if we do this now, then we remove that shot. We remove it. And that's hard to do. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, You are the salt of the earth. And you've got to seek the Lord on this, man. Well, let's love, let's welcome, let's tolerate. But you're the salt of the earth. And if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And that's what many of us become, is just trampled underfoot. We become user, used by users. We become enablers by those that are enabled to stay away from the Father's house. It's tough, isn't it? Lose your identity. No. We love the Lord more. We love you. You're always welcome here. When you humble yourself and repent, you're always welcome here with us. God, give me the grace to stand in that if it ever comes to it. Verse 11, Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, not, not, Shechem's not a her. <laughs> Shechem didn't, you know, identify it. I'm sorry. Okay. Then Shechem said to her, her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes, and wh whatever you say to me, I will give. Her daughter, I violated her. What's your price? I'd be like, I'm glad I brought my razor blade. I got my price for you right here, buddy. <laughs> you know, what's the price? That's what he's basically saying. But it's very interesting what happens. 
Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me, but give me the young woman as a wife. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamer, his father, and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. It's an interesting statement. The sons of Jacob acted deceitfully. Where did they learn that that's okay? Yeah. Dad. Just as recently as our last scene, Jacob fed Esau a line. Just as recently as our last scene, he fed Esau a line about traveling behind him slowly, and then he immediately turned aside to Succoth and built a house. Remember that? I'll come behind you slowly. And then he immediately went to the... Where did the kids learn that it's okay to lash out and scream when they don't get their way? Where do they learn disrespect and to be a bully? It is all, everything, 100% mom and dad. 100%. 100%. They may not see you do it, but do they see stars from doing it? Do you know what I'm saying? They may not see you do it, but when they do do it, because they're going to do it, because it's naturally going to be there, do they see stars? If you know what I'm saying. Here's the thing. Once a youngster is disrespectful, it's almost too late. I want you to know this. I want you to know this. Once they become that way and, they're, and they are that way, it's almost too late. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It does not say, correct a kid toward the way he should go. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, restrict the kid. It doesn't even say, spank the kid. Those are things that we do to react to their bad behavior. It says to train a kid, which means that starts day one. Training starts from day one. Olympics are coming up. Can you imagine if you, right now, Jared, just said, I'm going to be a speed skater in the Olympics, and training started right now. How well do you think he'd do? He'd probably look good in those real tight pants, though. You know what I'm saying? He'd probably look all right. But he'd do really terribly. Why? Because the training didn't start. He hasn't been trained. And I tell you, man, I tell you, it's when, when they start to scream and spit at you, Mom and Dad, you're almost too late already. We've got to start really early. We have to. We've got to train them. From day one when they are littles, because once they become young men and young women, there's, you can't train them any longer, can you? Jacob's sons come by this deceit honestly, and no amount of reasoning or rebuke from their father is going to turn them. No amount, no amount at this point, no amount. They each will have to find their pig pods, and they will as they starve in the land. They will starve in the land later in our story. They each will find their bottom, and they will bow. But that comes later. Verse 14, and then we're through. Well, verse 14 to the end. And they said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, and we will not take our daughter, then we will take our daughter and be gone. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's sons. Why? Because there's big bucks in it. Jacob's very rich. And so it pleased them. They're trying to get that money. So the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was more honorable than all the household of his father. It doesn't say much about the household of his father. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For indeed, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives, and let us give them our daughters only. On this condition, will the men consent to dwell with us to be one people? If every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, and every one of those men went, Wait. <laughs> but it's amazing what a man will do for women and money. It's amazing. Will not their livestock, their property, and every animal, they're selling it, of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of a city, he to Hamor and Shechem, his son, every male was circumcised. All who went out of the gate of his city. Now it came to pass on the third day, that's when they'd be the weakest. That's when they'd be in the most pain. And it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain, the two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, not Reuben, not the oldest. Interesting. Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. Now they will suffer for this later. They will lose their birthright for this later. And so will Reuben. And you know what that means? That means the birthright falls to whom? Judah. It's awesome. And they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword. Watch this. And they took Dinah. See, Dinah was there. 
Very interesting. And they took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, and their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field, and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives. They took captive and they plundered even all that was in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants. It's all about Jacob. Isn't that crazy? And the land among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? This is a bad scene. It's a hard chapter, I know, and we're through tonight. But I want you to just realize one thing. One thing that strikes me so very you know, uh, clearly here is that not once, not once in this entire chapter is God mentioned. Not one time. Has that been your week? Has that been your day, your year so far, your experience in your new job, or perhaps your old job, that it's been a bad scene and a hard chapter. Has that been you? Has that been you? John said in John 3.30, God, you must increase, and so help me, I must decrease. Remember that? You must increase, God, I must decrease. From verse 1, when Dinah set out to experience the world and Jacob was nowhere to be found, all the way to verse 31, when the bloody hands of the sons are raised against the father, how this would have been so very different, so much less death, so much less defilement, if God was the subject and the centerpiece of this chapter. But he's not. He's not even mentioned. So where's God worry right now? Where's God? Where's God? What, what would this chapter have looked like? If God had been the center, you know what I'm saying? What would it look like? You're the center of God's life. We ought to respond. Father, we love you tonight, and we're thankful, even though it's a tough chapter and a bad scene. Uh, God, we know that it's given for your eternal purposes and for our God, for our eternal and ap- and right now prophet, Father, if we would s- submit ourselves to what your spirit, to, to you, Holy Spirit, who now speaks in our hearts. God, I pray that you would sow these truths. Anything not of you, God, would be forgotten, left on the side, God. But all all that's been said and taught tonight that is of you and of your spirit, God, that we would not be able to retreat from it. We would not be able to run from it, God, that we might go and respond to it. And I pray you bless these folks as they go into the rest of their week, that you, Father, would remind them even now, remind them even now, God, that they are the very center of your life. You, you to them, man, they mean everything to you. And so, Father, would you help us, God, as a church, as a, as a church, God, to find our identity and protect our identity in you. We love you, Jesus. It's because of you, Father. It's because of you that we even are alive tonight. And so, God, your grace is sufficient for us. Help us to be spiritual towards each other, Father. Help us to be spirit-filled from you and towards you, God. And, Lord, all the soulish connections we have, they're so fun and they're so good. But, God, help them to be secondary as we, Father, seek you in spirit and in truth. We love you, Jesus. You are worthy. It's in your name we pray. Amen.